from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We'll start with business and particularly Wall Street. What's going on with the markets? It's a risk on kind of day, and Abigail Doodle is going to explain to us not only what's happening, but why. Risk, Abigail? Risk on indeed, David. We have very solid gains for the major averages here in the U.S. A continuation of what turned into a late day rally on Friday largely driven by those big tech earnings that came in better than expected for the most part. And at the end of the day, of course, the news that Microsoft is con considering buying uh, TikTok's U.S. assets, that really seemed to drive an extra leg at the end of the day Friday. It's continuing today. Take a look at Apple, up more than 3%, really helping both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, and for the Dow at that, at, for that uh, matter. The NASDAQ really outperforming, though, up 1.5%, and really confirming the fact that we uh, you know, have this risk on rally. Natural gas, of course, a commodity soaring up 16%. Bank of America seems somewhat bullish on natural gas. It could also have to do with some of the hot weather that we have in the U.S. But yes, David, the bulls are out. And one uh, economic uh, data point that's important, of course, the ISM manufacturing number came in today uh, at 10 a.m. It beat the survey, and it shows us that the economy, the manufacturing part of the economy, is expanding. So it's not just the micro of those strong earnings reports from late last week, but we also have a positive piece of uh, data. It'll be interesting to see what the payrolls report brings, of course, on Friday. Yeah, now we go, we're going to talk with the head of the National Association of Manufacturers a little later in the program. But right now, I want to know, it's not just the bulls are out, but how confident are they? What's going on with volatility? Because as I understand it, that's up as well. What does that tell us? You know, it's an interesting contradiction because the VIX and the VXN, and I'm so glad you're bringing this up, David. It's a very subtle point. But while we have stocks up, the VIX and the VXN, so those volatility indexes, uh, the VIX on the S&P 500, the VXN on the NASDAQ 100, both higher, telling you that uh, some folks are thinking that volatility could spike. The VIX curve points to uh, a big spike of volatility ahead of the election. And the uh, SKU index, sometimes called the panic index because it's comprised of far out of the money of puts, it is at levels seen last December and in the summer and September of 2018, both ahead of those big sell-offs. So there are reasons to think that some storm clouds could be ahead. Interesting around all of this, we of course have the dollar climbing for a second day in a row, uh, the best two days in fact for the dollar uh, since early June. That could, if that climb continues, there may be some technical reasons to think it could uh, that could happen, it could in turn pressure stocks. A lot of the rally that we've seen recently has been that weak dollar helping stocks and commodities. Stay tuned, David. There could be some more macro chapters ahead. Exactly. For the it looks like it could be an interesting August. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, it may be the dog days of summer down in Washington, but lawmakers have a lot of work to do before they can head to the beach because they are far apart, Republicans and Democrats, on that fourth round of stimulus. Welcome now, Greg Valliere. He is AGF Investments' chief U.S. policy strategist. Greg, always a delight to have you with us. Give us a sense of where this is because it sounds like they're far apart, but they, they say they're making progress. What does that mean? Yeah. I've gone, David, from being just totally pessimistic to maybe cautiously optimistic they can get something done. I don't see a huge package, but maybe $1,200 checks, maybe some kind of formula on unemployment benefits, maybe some aid to state and local governments. Uh, it's a start. Uh, maybe they'll have to come back after the August break and finish it. But the last 24 hours have made me a little bit more optimistic. Well, when you say come back after the break and finish it, are they going to get some payments going to the unemployed, for example? Because they're, they're now we cut them off last week. Yep. Are we going to get yep. some cash going back out to them during August? It's crucial. I mean, if, if you want to see a decent third quarter, and I think the third quarter is now not looking quite as good as it did a few weeks ago, you've got to get money in people's pockets. So, yes, I think there'll be something on unemployment. I think there'll be, there'll be maybe as important or more important, there'll be $1,200 checks to people who make Seventy or seventy-five thousand dollars or less. So th those would be the key features of a deal. I think they can do some of this, and then they'll kick the can down the road. They're, they may have to wait until September to look at liability reform, things like that. One of the things they can't cut, kick down the uh, kick the can down the road on is education. Kids have to yep. go to back to school. Are they going to get some money for s local school systems? Yes. I think there's agreement on about $100 billion, uh, probably $70 billion K through 12, another $30 billion for universities. I think that's one area where they have a deal. 
So one of the things we're hearing about today, Greg, Bloomberg's been reporting this, is the possibility that President Trump is contemplating going around Congress if he can't get a deal done there, and by executive order doing some of these things, including payroll tax suspension, including extending the moratorium on evictions, including unemployment insurance. Is that simply a bargaining ploy, or are they really serious about this? That sounds a lot easier said than done, David. I, I think that's going to be a tough one to get. I'm not sure the president has the authority to, through executive action to do this, especially stuff that involves uh, taxes. So he may say this. This may be a bargaining chip, as you say. But actually going that route, I think, has obstacles. Is the White House, is President Trump himself, feeling a fair amount of pressure at this point? We do have a little election coming in November. <laughs> and if we're going to start really getting some help to the economy, he needs it to happen sooner rather than later, doesn't he? He can't wait till September, October. I couldn't agree more. And I'm told by my sources on the Hill that uh, the president would take just about anything. I, I think he, he wants a bill, period, because he knows that a more stimulus means a better economy, which means he has a chance of winning. So I, I think he will put a lot of heat on Congress to, to get a, a bigger bill. The problem is the differences between Pelosi, McConnell, Schumer, these are big differences. That's why getting a comprehensive bill may be difficult this week. So even if it's a more limited bill, as you suggest, Greg, yep. what is the drop-dead deadline here? I mean, originally they were going to go into recess August 7, yep. and I heard something on August 14. When do they absolutely positively have to have something if they're going to get anything? You know, they don't have to leave. In fact, Pelosi has indicated she could keep them in. Uh, through through all of August. But it, I think people want to get out of Washington. It's not a real pleasant place in August. And I, I, I thought the 7th was the drop-dead day, but I think it could go into the next week. Uh, I, I still think there's enough time. There's still 10 days or so to, to get something done. Yeah, and also, besides it not being necessarily pleasant in the humid, hot uh, Washington, a lot of those people have elections. they got to get back home and be campaigning, don't they? Yes, they do. And I think there's been a real shift in the last few weeks that Republicans who are up for re-election are thinking about themselves, not the president. So I, I think the president does not have as strong a, an allegiance from Republicans than he did a, a few months ago. So one other issue pending right now, and it's hot in Washington, uh, figuratively at least, is TikTok. Yep. And what's going to happen with TikTok? Where does that stand right now? The president has made no secret of the fact he doesn't like TikTok having a presence in the United States. Well, I think he ought to take a victory. Sometimes you, 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 you should take, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say, if I could get 70 percent of what I want, that's pretty good. I'll come back and get the other 30 percent. So, no, I think it's a win-win. I think if, if Microsoft buys them, uh, you would deny Chinese any user da data from the customers, and it would put a U.S. company in charge of a very popular app. I, I think that uh, the argument for this is compelling. Well, you talk about a shotgun marriage, though. They've got essentially, as I understand it, 45 days to come to a deal. I don't think they have a price. I'm not sure how they would price it. And the price tag is going to be pretty high in all likelihood, Greg. Yeah, it would. But I think to allow Microsoft into an area where they haven't been very strong is very attractive to Microsoft. I think Trump is going to hear from a lot of politicians saying, do this. I mean, do you want relations with China to get even worse? I, I think, again, the, the, the facts in this would argue for approving the deal. Well, that raises the question, though, Greg, what comes next? I mean, we had Huawei. Now we have TikTok, the U.S. operation of TikTok. And we have the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, suggesting there's an awful lot of uh, tech work that China is doing in the United States that they don't like. Yeah, and I, I must say, both parties would agree on that. This is not just a Donald Trump crusade against China. Both parties are uh, very upset over the espionage, aside from, from TikTok. A and I do think there'll probably be more recriminations, more shutting of consulates. I think things are going to get worse before they get better. If Biden wins, maybe things get a little bit better next year. But I think we've got a, a deep freeze for many, many months to come. Is anybody advocating for keeping technological relations up with China? And I will say there is a little bit good for the goose, good for the gander here, because China has shut out a lot of U.S. social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google, for some time. A absolutely. A and I think that right now, uh, Peter Navarro, who's a, a hawk, as you know, uh, is calling the shots. And, and I think as long as he calls the shots, we stay in the deep freeze. 
Yeah, and as you say, right now it's hard to find a real advocate for China up on Capitol Hill, Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us, Greg. That's Greg Valier of AGF Investments. Coming up here, it looks to be a big week in politics with President Trump resetting his campaign and Vice President Biden on track to announce his running mate this week. Bloomberg political contributor Rick Davis is here to take us through. It is This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. And for that, we go to Karina Mitchell. Karina. David, thank you. The White House is exploring whether President Trump can act on a virus relief plan without the approval of Congress. Bloomberg has learned the president is considering extending enhanced unemployment benefits and eviction protection if lawmakers fail to act. Benefits expired on Friday. Democrats and Republicans have been unable to reach an agreement over a new coronavirus stimulus package. Talks are resuming again today. Meanwhile, Norway's government has banned cruise ships from entering its ports for 14 days after an outbreak of coronavirus on one ship infected more than 40 people. That cruise line is apologizing for mistakes that may have allowed the disease to spread. Hurdy Gruden officials say they didn't know they should have notified all passengers after the first case was reported. Health officials are worried the ship could have infected dozens of towns and villages along Norway's western coast. At Bloomberg has learned that the White House has given Microsoft and TikTok 45 days to work out a deal. Microsoft is trying to salvage a plan to buy the U.S. operations of the wildly popular Chinese app. At one point, President Trump had floated the idea of banning the app outright on national security grounds. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella spoke to the president yesterday to try to get his blessing for a deal. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Karina. Well, legislators are trying to hash out some sort of compromise on a fiscal stimulus bill. That's against the backdrop of an election this November, with the Democratic Convention now just two weeks away. We welcome now Bloomberg political contributor Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. Rick, always a delight to have you with us. So give us a sense of the politics right now of this stimulus negotiation? Well, conservative Republicans in the Senate have always opposed this supplemental uh, uh, contribution of $600 a week because they felt that statistics indicated that that was more than some people were actually making uh, when they were, were actually working. And so the negotiation, bid and ask, is somewhere between the $600 a week that has been currently in the, in the supplementals in the past, but also down to as little as $200 a week. And somewhere in there is a deal waiting to be found. Is there a sense that the American public are really getting concerned about debt? I mean, uh, normally a politician will respond to what they think their constituents want. Are there a lot of constituents out there saying, we don't want any more money being spent? Well, normally you'd find them in the sort of fiscal hawks of the Republican Party, you know, people who have been anti-national uh, you know, debt, uh, for a long time, but they have long since disappeared, and to some degree, harming the uh, the electoral prospects of the Republican Party because those people now don't have that uh, sort of clear difference between how the Republicans govern and how the Democrats go Democrats govern. So, without a clear difference in fiscal policy as it relates to the deficit. Uh, those voters have to look elsewhere for, for reasons to vote for one or the other candidate. So, as I say, we're only two weeks away from the first of the two conventions, the Democrats, and we're not that far away, something like 90 days away from the election yep. itself. At the same time, the incumbent, President Trump, is really reconstituting his, his um, whole entire campaign, got a new campaign manager, pulled a lot of ads. What's going on there? Well, the new campaign manager, Bill Stepien, decided to take a step back. They suspended advertising for a couple of days last week. They brought in a new strategist for the battleground states, a new deputy for him in the campaign, uh, and assorted other uh, folks. And they said, where do we stand? I mean, when they looked at these battleground states, not only the original battleground states from 2016, they realized they were behind in almost every single one. Uh, then they looked at some new emerging states like Georgia, which weren't even on the list two years ago, and are now actually an area where the Trump campaign is putting heavy resources on TV, social media, and on the ground. So, so the idea here was to find a pathway 
to those electoral votes that Donald Trump could try and snake his way through like he did last time. The problem is they don't have a lot of great options. There's not a clear path. Those places like Michigan, where Trump was able to win by just 11,000 votes last time, he's, you know, five to seven to 10 points behind in most public surveys. So, so in the meantime, uh, Joe Biden has said it'll be this week. Now there's a suggestion it might slip till next week when he picks his running mate. You've been in the room when these running mates have been chosen. What should he be looking for? Is this to get elected or what, what does the running mate do for him? Well, I've always thought that uh, candidates who are running ahead have the luxury of picking someone they want to help govern with. Uh, candidates who are running from behind um, tend to pick candidates who try to help them get elected. And, uh, and sort of, we'll figure out what to do with them when, when, when I get elected. So uh, I think that Biden, because of his sort of cautious history uh, and the fact that he is comfortably ahead in most of the national polls, I mean, seven to 10 percent, uh, he is probably going to pick someone who he thinks can be good for the Democratic Party, good for the country, good for the White House and his governing style, but also um, uh, has a clear pathway to helping with constituencies that he needs. He's already discussed the fact that he's going to pick a woman, which is a very strong step toward recruiting these suburban women uh, in, uh, in, in who are up for grabs in this election. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what angle he takes. Does he go the, se the <clears throat> secure route, right. like he the Barack Obama, or does he take more risks? Yeah, and I want to get into, uh, into the specific candidates with you in our second hour of Balance of Power on the radio. But in the meantime, I want to get one question at least in about the mechanics of voting November 3rd, because we're seeing sure. more and more recounts. There's going to be a lot of mail-in ba ballots, whether President Trump wants that or not. We're not going to have an answer, are we, uh, election night? No, uh, it's going to probably be the next day. We've had some issues in election counting in the past. Uh, the most famous was in 2000 for the hanging chads in Florida, and it took us a couple of months. It probably won't take that long this time. But uh, the fact is that there are going to be a sizable increase in mail-in ballots, and it will take longer to process those than walk-ins on Election Day. Uh, but uh, but nobody, I think, has a clear sense, one, as to how big that number will be as far as mail-in ballots, and two, how long these states will take to process. Elections on Election Day are run by states. They're not run by the federal government. And each state has a different approach to how to take the vote and also to count it. And so it'll be a patchwork quilt of you know, over 50 different options that states have to try and run this election during COVID. Well, and having the, the scars to show for the 2000 election, where we had sort of Bush versus Gore, and it was essentially a tie election, it's not just the process of counting them, but then challenges, court challenges, to what the results are as well. And people are gearing up. Certainly the Trump campaign is, and I've heard rumors the Biden campaign is as well. They could have challenges right across the country. Yeah, there's a euphemism in presidential campaigns called ballot security. And what it really means is ballot challenges. And you have to recruit lawyers in every single state who have a background, who can practice law in those states to be responsible to the campaign in order to make challenges either at each and every precinct uh, where you think there might have been voting irregularities or where you would like to have a recount or contest, but also statewide if there is endemic problems with the election day count. Um, this election will actually have also an additional uh, uh, curveball thrown to it in that um, even though there will be Election Day voting in all these states uh, that don't have total uh, mail vote, they will have a limited number of people who can go and work at those polls, so probably a limited number of poll uh, options, and that will cause lines and more contests. So, so it's going to be a very litigious election. So, Rick, just briefly here at the end, uh, is, this, is this cake baked, essentially? Is it too late for those states to be doing anything to really make the situation better? No, I think that a lot of these states, we notice uh, three in just the last week, uh, have legislative action going on to go to mail-in voting, uh, to basically allow the state to mail all the ballots out and let folks vote by mail. Uh, I think you'll see continuing improvements and or changes in uh, mailing uh, uh, ballots to, uh, to voters. And, uh, and that'll go on probably for another 30 days. After that, uh, in some of these states, uh, those ballots will already hit yeah. households in early September, and the voting will begin yeah. in earnest. Really so, good point. Uh, time yeah. is running.
Yeah, our time is running out. Thank you so much. Such a treat. As I said, Rick Davis, our Bloomberg contributor, will be joining us again in the second hour of Balance of Power to talk about the candidates for Joe Biden. Still ahead here, more on Microsoft's hoping to buy TikTok's U.S. operations and is our stock of the hour. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Time now for the stock of the hour, and it's going to be Microsoft. Microsoft is trying to buy the U.S. and other operations of TikTok before President Trump shuts down their operations here in this country. Bloomberg's Scarlett Fu is here with the story. And David, all that's certain right now is the deadline. The timeline here is six weeks. That's how long Microsoft has to work out a deal here to buy parts of TikTok. Bloomberg is reporting that everything else is up for negotiations, whether it's the price, the terms, or how technology sharing or the transfer of assets would work. Now, for Microsoft, buying TikTok would give its consumer and social uh, media businesses a big shot in the arm. Right now, its main exposure to that is through LinkedIn, which it bought back in 2016 for $24 billion. And if you look at how tech has performed. We all know it's been the star performer since the bottom on March 23rd, but it's really hardware that's led the way. Apple has almost doubled, doubled in value since March 23rd, while software has done well, but trailing in comparison because it's mainly smaller companies that have been gaining. Microsoft up 60%, but the likes of smaller companies not really driving that index higher, David. So let's talk a little bit about what's motivating the president as far as we know. I mean, there are these issues with Hong Kong, and the president certainly has Democrat as well as Republican backing up at the Hill for that. At the same time, we have to bear in mind, Beijing has banned a lot of U.S. social media companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google for some time. So what's behind this, do we think, Scarlett? Yeah, this is definitely a flashpoint in China-U.S. relations, and that's what makes this so complicated, right? Because you've got the two companies involved. You also have the White House, which is a third party in the negotiations. Trade advisor Peter Navarro jumped on this and said that he thinks TikTok should be simply banned, not sold to anyone, including Microsoft. Meantime, you've got the New York Times reporting that Mnuchin, Kudlow have all argued to President Trump making their case for why Microsoft should be allowed to buy TikTok. And they've enlisted lawmakers, including Senators Cornyn, Graham and Rubio to help make the case. President Trump is not happy with TikTok users who use the platform to disrupt his campaign activities. But at the same time, David, the White House doesn't want to anger the 165 million TikTok users in the U.S. These are young voters who could turn on the White House come November. TikTok, for its part, has uh, seen the writing on the wall. You can see how much money it's spent on lobbying D.C., trying to improve the op optics, hiring an American CEO, uh, former Disney executive Kevin Meyer, to lead the company. But I don't know if that's going to do anything here because uh, you've got political forces that overwhelm the monetary considerations. Yeah, I know Kevin very well. I worked with him. He has his hands full. He has yep. my complete sympathy and support. Thank you so much to Scarlet Fu. In the meantime, coming up here, the president's looking for ways to hit back at, at B Beijing for the coronavirus. This has become a political hot potato. We're going to cover next the question. This is Bounce of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Karina Mitchell. David, the United States can still beat the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to the World Health Organization's top epidemiologist, Maria Van Kerkhove. She says Americans should follow the guidelines that have been set, including wearing masks, social distancing, and staying home when asked to do so. She added, quote, the United States can turn this around. Meanwhile, White House advisors and Democrats are resuming those stalemated talks on a new stimulus package. Negotiations become increasingly urgent this week. Millions of jobless Americans have just lost their $600 a week supplemental benefits, and the Senate is set to leave for an extended break on Friday. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows says he's not optimistic about a quick resolution. And Isaias could cause $1.5 billion in losses as it picks up speed and strength. Tropical storm and hurricane warnings reach from South Carolina to New York City. The storm will sweep through the mid-Atlantic after striking the Carolinas, spinning over New York late Tuesday. It killed at least one woman in Puerto Rico and caused some damage across the Bahamas. 
Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Karina. We got some numbers on manufacturing out this morning. They showed that the indices are actually back up in positive territory for the most part, although not wildly so. Welcome now, Jay Timmons. He is president of the National Association of Manufacturers. So, Jay, welcome. Good to have you with us. Give us your mm -hmm. take on these numbers today from ISM and, and, and PMI for that as well. Well, look, we're always going to uh, welcome good news. And, and let's face it, this is good news coming off of six pretty difficult months in manufacturing and frankly, six difficult months for the entire economy. So this is, this I hope is a precursor to additional good news throughout the rest of this year, but we're gonna have to wait and see. And a lot of this really comes down to uh, whether the American people want to resume kind of normal activities or not. And if they do, then we're all going to have to do the smart thing, take precautions, wear masks in public, make sure that we're all protecting each other so that so that we're not losing people, either completely losing people through death or through hospitalization or terrible sickness um, so that they can't work, so that they can't function. So hopefully these are good numbers that are going to propel us into the future with more good numbers. So, so uh, of course, these ISM and PMI numbers are month over month. So the direction is good. It's positive. It's not to say we've dug ourselves out of the hole by any means. But one of the numbers that really jumped out at me was employment, because that was down at 44.3. What's the situation with getting people back into the plants to manufacture things? So that's a great question, David. Uh, you know, throughout the pandemic, manufacturers have been essential workers making sure that we're producing the medical supplies and the PPE and the food supply that has been so necessary to keep keep our economy uh, or keep our country in survival mode. Uh, but at the same time, it's been a very bad business environment. So there have been uh, some reductions in force in manufacturing. However, I think we're gonna start to see those folks coming back onto the job. You know, before before the pandemic, we had about a half a million jobs open in manufacturing. Half a million. It's because we couldn't find people with the skills that we needed to do these very, very um, modern high-tech jobs. We still have jobs, even with even with the, the reduction in force, we still have jobs that we can't fill. That's why we're we're going to be kicking off when all this ends and we can actually interact with each other again. We're going to be kicking off our creators wanted tour to to try to attract more people into the manufacturing workforce. It seems counterintuitive to say that with unemployment growing in this country, that we still can't find people with the right skills. But it is it is uh, reality, unfortunately. Jay, give us a sense of what a manufacturer has to do in this COVID-19 world to keep the workers safe. I mean, to what extent do they really have to retool the way they manufacture? What kinds of costs are they incurring to keep people socially distanced and protected? You know, manufacturers saw this coming uh, in January, and we were sounding the alarm bells because some of our manufacturers had facilities in Asia. So they saw this pandemic uh, erupting. They knew what they had to do. They started to, to deal with it in Asia by putting in uh, more protocols, more distancing protocols, uh, masks and PPE, as well as some very deep uh, sanitization of their facilities. They brought that knowledge to the United States. They started using that very early on in the pandemic. We're still doing that, obviously, we're still doing that. And we're trying to um, make sure that that message gets out to other parts of the economy. Uh, manufacturers, by and large, have been successful in stemming the flow of uh, or stemming the infection rate uh, at their facilities. But you know what? We can't take care of the entire world. We can't, we can't monitor what people are doing outside of the workplace, which is why we need everybody to be responsible, wear a mask, it's so important, and also why we need some legislative solutions like liability protections for employers who are trying to do the right thing. We're not saying uh, uh, protect folks who aren't doing the right thing. We're saying don't penalize those who are doing the right thing and keeping their employees safe while at the workplace. So, Jay, that takes us to this so-called fourth wave of stimulus because on the Republican proposal, they do have that liability protection. At the same time, one of the issues is the level of unemployment supplemental, if I can call it that, insurance. A lot of talk about the fact that some people are getting paid more not to work than to work. There's some studies that indicate that. Is it your experience with your members that, in fact, some people are not coming back to work because of that? Or are your workers paid well above that level? Thank you very much for that question. You're the first reporter to ask me that question. 
I will give you the, uh, the answer that I asked my team to prepare for me. Um, we asked all of our members whether this was a problem early on, and a lot of them thought that it might be. We actually don't have one instance where a manufacturer has not been able to bring people back uh, to the workplace. And I think it's because of the point that you make. Our wages are higher. I can't speak for other sectors of the economy. There may well be that issue. But what I know about manufacturing workers is they really were raring to get back to work and to be a part of the productive part of our economy. So we haven't seen it in our sector, and I'm very happy for that. I can't really speak for other sectors, though. So, Jay, when you talk about the lack of skilled workers that you need, some of those workers historically have come from overseas, and there's a visa program like the H-1B visa system. You've joined with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others to sue the administration because they've really suspended that. Where does that stand? Yeah, so the NAM did sue uh, the federal government to stop the, uh, the implementation of, of uh, that action. Uh, we've, we've sought injunctive relief from the courts. And we're waiting to see where this is going to, to go. We, we believe we have a very strong case because, look, we, we were just getting back on our feet as, man, as the manufacturing economy when COVID hit. It obviously hit us hard. We kept going and we're trying, as your numbers pointed out or the numbers that you quoted pointed out at the beginning of this interview, we're starting to get back on our feet again. Let's not kick us again while we're down. So we need to make sure that we have access to talent. We need to make sure there's a good example that we cited in our court documents. We had a, a, a person who was part of the L visa program coming in from, from uh, Europe and had already been a part of this particular employer's uh, workforce. He's gonna be denied entry. If he had come here to set up the program that this particular manufacturer wanted set up as a technology manufacturer, we would have hired up to 50 Americans as part of that program. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to have to stay back. He's going to do the program in Europe, and they're going to hire 50 Europeans. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to disadvantage American manufacturers? Why would we not want more manufacturing employees? And that's what this action does. I get that it plays to a political audience. Right. I understand yeah. that. But we really all need to be focused right now on getting back to some sense of normalcy, getting our economy back. So that means none of these uh, uh, politically popular, but unfortunately economic in economically damaging programs. It means all of us doing our part to keep everybody else safe. And it means implementing smart measures like liability reforms. And wear those masks. Thanks so much, Jay. Really appreciate you being with us. That's Jay Timmons. He's president of the National Association of Manufacturers. Coming up, we're going to start our week-long series on returning to school. And we're going to start with the youngest students. Tom Wyatt, CEO of Kindercare, is here to tell us what we really need to do to get early childhood learning back coming back in September. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. One of the biggest issues on the national agenda is the beginning of the school year. Can students return to the classroom? What role does remote learning play? And if students are not back in school, what does that mean to parents who are also trying to get back to their work? Balance of Power is presenting a series of guests on these subjects throughout this week, and we're going to begin at the beginning with the youngest school students and the CEO of the largest child care provider in the country. He is Tom Wyatt of Kindercare. Tom, welcome. Great to have you with us. Give us a sense of where you are at Kindercare in terms of the, the services you're providing right now in this time of COVID. I'd be happy to, David. And again, thanks for the opportunity. We we actually, as the states uh, loosened up over the last uh, six, seven weeks, we were able to reopen our centers. We have around 1,500 centers around the country in 40 states, and we closed all but 450 of those during the height of the pandemic back in March and April, only serving the uh, uh, essential workers, if you will. But now we're totally open. Our centers are running at about 40, 45 percent of capacity because the states are still mandating uh, smaller class sizes, and uh, and we're certainly following all those mandates. But what I tell you is I'm excited to say, one, that we are able to support families as they go back to work. Uh, we are in a position, uh, thanks to the CDC, with very disciplined protocols, both health and safety. 
Uh, we provide each of our centers and uh, center directors an ambassador of health and safety. And so we, we take that very seriously. And I will tell you that at this point, our uh, actual transmission rate is one-fifth that of each state that we're in, and we track that daily. Well, it's fascinating. Now, how do you get that done? Because I have to say, thinking about small children interacting with each other and with teachers, it's not easy to have them wear masks, to have social distancing, things like that. How do you do that with little kids? Well, that's a very good question. Actually, we do not require, nor does the CDC, uh, the little children, and I'm talking from literally infant to fifth, uh, fifth five-year-olds, uh, to wear masks. What we do is, one, the, the classroom used to have 20 children in it on average. They now have uh, nine or ten. Uh, they now, uh, when they sit for their snack and their meal during the day, uh, we split the uh, classroom and the children up into uh, smaller uh, collections of children. And when they nap, uh, they are literally spread throughout the classroom at least six feet apart. Uh, we take the temperature the second they come into the room. Uh, we have pods set up, which you've heard also school age uh, providers offering pods. And what that means is any child that comes into one of our centers, uh, they literally walk into the front door. A pod member, a teacher from the her pod or his pod, come pick them up, take them back to the room, uh, and they stay with that group of teachers and children all day long. So there's no transmission across classrooms or across the, the center. And what are you doing about things like testing, both for the instructors and also for the children? I mean, are you doing temperature tests? Are you actually testing for COVID-19? How do you make sure you know if there's a hot spot that develops? We, we ask everyone who enters our center, our staff, as well as the children, anyone that enters has to first fill out a questionnaire every morning, uh, and then they do get their temperature checked. And in many states, uh, our teachers are uh, supported in getting uh, the actual COVID-19 test. In those states, uh, we provide that as well. So uh, we are uh, extremely disciplined about the approach we take uh, and being sure that everyone who walks into our center at that point in time does not have a temperature uh, and not shows no signs of symptoms relative to COVID-19. So, t uh, Tom, you said that your transmission rate is only 20 percent, as I understood the numbers of what it is in the yep. state generally where you are. But it means there must have been some transmission. Have you had some hotspots? And how do you react to those hotspots? Do you do contact tracing with little children, things like that? Yeah, that's a, another very good question. Yes, we do. Uh, and I, I'll give you one example. We had one center, <clears throat> because of the pod pro program, when you have a transmission, it's, it's literally relegated into one uh, center at a time. So you may have one or two or three in that pod, uh, but you literally keep it inside of uh, that, that one room instead of uh, it getting out into the other classrooms. What we do, our protocol is that any transmission that is found in any one of our classrooms, if it's only one, we shut down that center for 72 hours, we sanitize that classroom and, and the center, uh, and then we reopen. If in fact, and this has happened to us, if in fact we have more than one transmission in a given room or in multiple rooms of a, of a, of a school, at that point in time, we close down that center for 14 days. We fumigate it, uh, sanitize it, and we retrain the teaching staff and the uh, rest of the staff of the center, uh, and then we reopen it after 14 days. So, so, Tom, what advice would you give to public schools across the country? I mean, you have experience with this now over the course of the summer. What advice would you give? Because there are a lot of parents out there very nervous about this. And by the way, a lot of teachers are as well. Well, and as they should be. I mean, this is uh, these are unprecedented times. I'll tell you, uh, one of our other brands inside of Kindercare is Champions, and Champions is a before and after school program that is working with public and private schools around the country to help them come back together uh, as safely as possible. And one of the things that we truly believe in, because of our experience during the height of the pandemic, is the pod concept. We believe that is a great way to control the spread of COVID-19 uh, and also be sure that children are safe and are, quite frankly, secure in the classroom. As far as schools are concerned, we're seeing many schools deciding to literally start virtually, at least for the first two to four weeks, uh, and then consider uh, splitting classrooms in half, bringing half the children a couple of days a week, 
uh, sanitizing during the middle of the week and then bringing the other half uh, at the end of the week. And, and we think that's one of the better models that's out there. Uh, we are seeing very few of the public school system uh, processes saying that they're going to bring back schools normally because it's just too many children in, in a classroom. So I'd say the, uh, you know, practice pods, practice the disciplines of taking temperature before the children come into the classroom at least every other day, but we would suggest every day as we do in early childhood education. Um, and, and consider waves of children, reduce waves of children, uh, instead of bringing the classrooms back uh, totally. Okay, Tom, it was a great pleasure uh, to have you with us. It was very informative. I must say I learned a lot. That is Tom Wyatt. He is the CEO of KinderCare. Coming up here, the president of the Dallas Fed, Robert Kaplan, with his views on the economy and what could be done about it. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Robert Kaplan, the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve, spoke earlier today with our colleague Michael McKee about the state of the U.S. economy and what the Fed and others can do about it. It's still our view that we'll contract for the year at about 45 to 5%. It has been our view after a very sharp decline in the second quarter. We'd have very healthy rebound in the third and the fourth quarter. I think, I think uh, that rebound is more muted in the United States now. Uh, and uh, it's caused me to think that the unemployment rate, if we don't do a better job managing the virus, the unemployment rate is, is likely to be above 9%, between 9 and 10%. So we've, we've moved up our unemployment forecast uh, and so um, I think we've got a rebound, uh, but it's it's much more muted than it was. And if we if we don't do a better job managing the virus, we're going to have lower growth and we're going to have a higher unemployment rate. And so I've been spending a lot of my time talking more about the virus than anything else because it's so critical to the recovery. Well, the $600 extra unemployment bonus and eviction moratorium, they're gone now. First, has the Fed, has your staff modeled the impact of that on the economy? And second, should we expect a wave of defaults that might affect credit markets? We, we have looked at it. And one of the things that's unusual about this downturn that we've just had is incomes have stayed relatively solid, and a big part of the reason is these uh, unemployment benefits. And so we're normally in a downturn, you see a drop in incomes. We haven't seen that here. Uh, it's still my view that in some form, we'll get an extension of unemployment benefits. So uh, I'm quite hopeful that that will continue. But if it didn't, uh, yeah, you would see a further weakening in the economy, and uh, in particular because consumers wouldn't have as much money in their pocket to spend. Any business people telling you that $600 bonus was keeping people from coming back to the labor force? Uh, a lot of business people were telling me that, honestly. They were, they were telling me that uh, it was challenging to hire people. Uh, we've looked at a number of studies. We've done our own work. We don't see it as much in the data, but I can tell you I'm hearing it uh, from business people. Uh, and so, however, uh, whatever the right answer is, uh, I, I think you still are going to need to see extension of unemployment. It may be restructured to some extent from the $600, but, but I think it's important that we see an extension of it. And I think the increased incomes while it may have while it may have made it hard for certain individual businesses to hire, it's helped create jobs because it's helped bolster consumer spending. So the net effect still has probably been positive for the economy and for employment. A number of your uh, uh, colleagues, uh, well, at least a number of epidemiologists joined by your colleague, Neil Kashkari of Minneapolis, uh, say that we need another nationwide lockdown for about four weeks to defeat the virus and that that should be job one over reopening the economy. What do you think of that? Uh, 
I probably have a somewhat different uh, view based on my conversations, again, with epidemiologists locally and through the country, in that uh, m the ep epidemiologists I've spoken with, which has been, been widespread conversations, believe we could manage uh, this economy and the virus and have the economy open if all of us wore masks. That's first and foremost, and then we need a good testing and contact tracing regime. But in particular, uh, if we all wore masks, they believe it would substantially mute the transmission of the virus, and you would not need to do a widespread lockdown. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many of them fear if you did if you did more lockdowns, if you still don't have good following of the healthcare protocols, the lockdown to some extent would be wasted. And so uh, I think their advice is. Uh, be very careful about the reopening, uh, enforce a widespread uh, practice of wearing masks, social distancing. That was Dallas Federal Reserve President Robert Kaplan speaking earlier today to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Coming up on Balance Hour in our second hour on Bloomberg Radio, we're going to have Rick Davis back, as we promised, to go through the various candidates who might be Joe Biden's running mate, something he's supposed to announce uh, maybe later this week, maybe next week. We'll see, but certainly before the convention two weeks from now. In addition to that, we're going to talk with a, an expert from the Council on Foreign Relations about cybersecurity and President Trump insisting that TikTok U.S. be sold. And finally, we're going to talk with Matt Godden. He is Centerline Logistics uh, CEO about ocean transport and what it's telling us about the economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.